This is Quick Bits for the week of March 20th to March 24th. You know, basically the first week of the Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash trial. That's what I'm breaking down today. What is this case over? What has the testimony been? And of course, we're going to have to talk about some of these awkward moments in Gwyneth Paltrow's testimony. So that's what we're getting into right now. I'm legal analyst Emily D. Baker. This is the Quick Bits, where I break down just the main points of the pop culture and entertainment cases I'm currently covering on YouTube and the Emily Show podcast. Let's get into it. Okay. Um, but what about prior inconsistent statements, Your Honor? I'm Look at her face. To ask Here it comes. She's testified. Here it comes. She, she's lied under oath a number of times, and I want to be able Your Honor, to that show the jury that. And I want it withdrawn. This moment. Well. I, I'm she a, has testified just, just a moment. Consistent. Just a moment. Just a moment. Well, just counsel, just I'm talking, okay? Have a seat. Ooh. Have a seat. If you haven't watched any of this trial, that's just a sampling of what the lawyering has been like. The first lawyer speaking is the plaintiff's attorney. The second lawyer speaking is lead counsel for Gwyneth Paltrow. She was accused of lying under oath. That was quickly backtracked, but we'll get there. Let's talk about what this trial's even about, shall we? Here's a quick recap of this trial. So if you've watched none of it, here we go. On February 26, 2016, the plaintiff, Terry Sanderson, alleges that Gwyneth Paltrow ran into him from behind while they were skiing at Deer Valley and knocked him down, knocking him unconscious and leaving him laying face down in the snow for a substantial period of time that those injuries he has not recovered from, that he had four broken ribs, and that Gwyneth Paltrow is negligent in her skiing. He was the skier further down the hill, and therefore she is at fault for his injuries. Gwyneth Paltrow has countersued him or cross-claimed him, alleging that, in fact, it was him that ran into her. She was the downhill skier. He came up and ran into her from behind, and then someone caught an edge. They fell over to the side, and she fell on top of him as they fell over to the side, but she was the downhill skier. We are now a week into this case, and we have not heard from the plaintiff yet, but what this jury will have to decide in this case, and just for a reminder, this is a civil case. This is over monetary damages and attorney's fees. The claims on both sides are for simple negligence. That is it. Who was the negligent party? Essentially, who caused this crash? Was it him or was it her? The jury has to find that there is a duty. And in this case, we've heard the rules in Utah or the skier downhill is owed that duty of care that the skier further up the hill has to be mindful of who's downhill and avoid the downhill skiers. A breach of that duty. Somebody failed to do what we just talked about and that that caused injury to a party. So the rules of the slope is going to come into play here. What the attorneys have to convince this jury is that one party is more than 50% at fault. Someone has to tip these scales to say the other party is more than 50% at fault. What could very possibly happen in this case is that the jury's like, um, y'all just walk away. 50-50 at fault. You were both skiing. You assumed the risk. It's a 50-50 at fault. And then no one recovers. If somebody is more at fault and the jury apportions that, that somebody is maybe 10% at fault and the other person is 90% at fault, then the person who is 90% at fault is liable, then the other person gets 90% of the damages awarded. In this case, what is being sought in the way of damages, and I've seen this misreported a lot, but during opening statements, it was again reiterated that Terry Sanderson, the plaintiff, is seeking $3 million $276,000 for the value of damages done to him. Both parties are seeking attorney's fees. Gwyneth Paltrow is seeking $1 in damages. It came up a lot. And that is the summary of this case. Let's get into what happened this week at trial. From opening statements, it was clear that these attorneys are maybe a little different than we've seen in other cases. The opening statements for the plaintiff, Terry Sanderson, said that he was not at fault in this accident, that he has been injured. He had four broken ribs after this ski collision, a concussion and brain injury that has been persistent and seems to be permanent, that multiple doctors will testify, not just about the injuries, about the changes in his 
personality and his cognition, but also that a doctor will testify that the way his ribs were broken could only be caused by Gwyneth Paltrow hitting him from behind and then landing on him. What's interesting is when we finally got to Paltrow's testimony, she said that he was behind her, but when they fell, she did land on him. So it actually does fit with that expert's testimony, I think. We then heard that his family will testify about his life changing injuries from this and finally asking for that $3,276,000. Then Gwyneth Paltrow's attorney started the opening and started talking about Lady Justice and ancient Greece. And really the only time I think you're talking about the history of the honored and storied legal tradition is when you really don't have much else to say. But I think rewatching this opening, it was to get to sympathy. This is a sympathetic plaintiff, depending on who you ask. He is an older gentleman. He is now in his mid-70s. He was 69 when this happened. His life has been changed by this. Now, of course, the defense is going to argue that he had some of these pre-existing medical conditions beforehand, and these cognition changes are not due to the ski accident, but due to other things. But it's clear that there has been a change for him, that his life has changed. And so really relaying to the jury that sympathy and feeling sympathetic for him is not a reason to find Gwyneth Paltrow caused this ski collision. He then finished his opening statements by arguing a whole bunch, not just to the jury, but also with opposing counsel. He said that he believed the case to be utter BS, and when properly called on the improper opening statement objection, he said, but your honor, that's fair, that's fair. Yes, he started to say it's fair argument, and no, you can't argue an opening statement. So it already started off spicy, and he looked at the defense attorneys and said, I would like to just be able to continue without any more objections. If you missed my coverage of opening statements, it'll be linked down below. Then we got into the first witnesses. This is supposed to be an eight-day trial, so we are actually just getting into the last week of this trial going into this week. So the first witnesses were the ski friend that was there on the slopes with Terry Sanderson and then the woman he was dating during the time of the accident. The friend retold what he saw at the accident scene, which Gwyneth Paltrow in her testimony called inaccurate, and said he couldn't have seen what he thought he saw. Um, and the friend said that Terry Sanderson was knocked unconscious and was laying face down in the snow for minutes and no one did anything. And then he got up and skied further down the slope before he was taken out by a toboggan that they called ski patrol later. The woman that he was dating at the time of the accident said they had a great time. His life was very full. They were very active. They were constantly going and doing. They were goers and doers. And after the accident, all of that changed and his personality changed and they ended their relationship. We then had a number of doctors talking about post-concussive syndrome. And one doctor who has now been photoshopped into all of the Hogwarts things, you're going to have to go watch his testimony to see why, who testified that the only way this could have happened is if the plaintiff was in fact struck from behind and then landed on his arm against his ribs. And that's how he broke his ribs. And as I am talking about my ribs, it's a perfect time to tell you, um, yes, the purple hoodies are finally in the lawn or shop. That'll be linked down below. They are here and I love them. Then we heard from plaintiff's family members, his two daughters. He was not in the courtroom during any of this testimony. And during opening statements, his lawyers said that he wouldn't be. Both of his daughters talked about what their dad was like before the accident and after. And both daughters had a very different vibe. One clearly more upset on the stand than the other. But even though they talked about the fact that his life had changed and his joy was gone and his temper was shorter, they also talked about the fact that he's obsessed with this case and he's kind of stuck on this case and he feels that it's unjust that all of this could be done to him and no one would be held responsible and that no one has apologized for this. We also had heard during the opening statement for Gwyneth Paltrow's attorney that there are three daughters of this plaintiff and though the plaintiff would be calling two of them, that Gwyneth Paltrow's team would be calling the third daughter who's estranged from her father. And he asked about that sister, Jenny, quite a bit from the other two. But somewhere in the middle of the week, it became obvious that Jenny did not intend to actually appear in court. 
and had not been properly subpoenaed. I do not think we will hear from Jenny at all during this case, but it's very interesting to see her sisters discount her experience with her father when asked about what her experience with her father was by defense counsel. Then we get to Gwyneth Paltrow's testimony, and it was with a attorney that we hadn't seen before, the attorney that ends up apologizing for stating in open court that Gwyneth Paltrow had lied under oath numerous times. So let's take a look at how that wrapped up in court and what the judge ended up doing. Do you like this layout? I like this layout. Okay, when the, the statement that you just made, do you want to rephrase that? <laughs> yes. yes. She has made prior inconsistent statements. That's different. During her deposition, Ms. Paltrow was asked a number of times, three, four, five times. That, that may be on, on this issue. That yes. may be, but to me, without some witness tying it into elements of this case or the essential issues in this case, um, I see it as collateral impeachment. So. Even the fact that Mr. Ramon has testified that she skied into Mr. Sanderson, as in she is also walking into walls, et cetera. Not the same. I'm going to stand by my ruling. I haven't, uh, I haven't revisited it. Um, I think it's a good ruling. There was, and I am sorry, I'm not, I, all I'm saying there were inconsistent statements. I am not trying that's, to slander Ms. Paltrow or nor say that she's lying. Not. In any which way form. That's form. not what you said, though. Okay. I'm not trying to say she's lying. You just said that she was lying. This is how this trial has gone. But this was not the only moments with this attorney and Gwyneth Paltrow. Not only did she ask Gwyneth Paltrow if she's suing for just $1 because Taylor Swift had done so, and then went on to inquire about Gwyneth Paltrow's relationship with Taylor Swift and whether or not she sent intimate gifts to Taylor Swift. I want to know what gifts are being sent from Gwyneth Paltrow to Taylor Swift. I am still left with this burning question that has not been answered. But then Paltrow's attorney, sitting at counsel table, quips in in the middle of testimony, why don't you ask her about Oprah? At one point, he quipped in and answered and asked a question for Paltrow, coaching her directly from counsel table, and nobody said anything. This trial has been B-A-N-A-N-A-S. She's probably friends with Gwen Stefani, too. I get it. They're both named Gwen. We need to take a look at some of these wild moments from court. This all happened during Paltrow's testimony. You were wearing goggles, a helmet. Yes. Okay, kind of looked like everybody else on the slope. That's always my intention. Okay. Probably had a better ski outfit though, I bet. <laughs> I still have the same one. <laughs> May I ask how tall you are? I'm just under 5'10". Okay, I am so jealous. I what? think I'm shrinking though. <laughs> you and me both. I have to wear four inch heels just to make it to 5'5". Five five, well, so. They're very nice. Oh, thank you. And you're not trained in accident reconstruction. Me? Yeah. No. Neither am I. What? I was yelling at him. Pretty loud. Pretty was, forceful. I was pretty upset. Right? You're yeah. small but mighty. <sighs> Actually, you're not that small. Okay, and I'm assuming... Actually, you're not that small, she you're said. You're here. <laughs> that you're a good tipper. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. I wouldn't expect anything less. If you're left going, Emily, what? Yes. That's how that examination of Gwyneth Paltrow by the plaintiff's attorney went. It was the only part of testimony he has been present in court for. I expect we will see him more this week. Of course, he will be on the stand Monday, and then we will start getting into the experts on Paltrow's side. We will see if Paltrow's attorneys decide to call her again. But it was really and truly just that strange. She testified for about two hours. Paltrow's testimony was very clear that Sanderson skied up behind her, that she was skiing down the hill. She saw skis come in between her skis and then heard a moan or groan in her ear. And then a few seconds later, they fell to the side and she landed on top of him. She was very consistent and very clear. And it seems that her testimony on that hasn't shifted at all. What they really tried to hammer her about in her testimony was, well, you said you're suing for a dollar, but aren't you asking for attorney's fees? And Paltrow said, well, I'm asking that the lawyers be reimbursed. That doesn't go to me. I'm asking for a dollar 
that goes to me for my damages, even though having to miss a half day of skiing after I've paid for ski instructors and all the rest of it is a more substantial loss than any of that. She testified that she was sore after the crash, that she went in from skiing for the day and had a massage, um, and that her knee was, was feeling bad, but that she didn't have medical check any of that out. We will see what happens when the plaintiff testifies, but hopefully you are now all caught up in this trial. Uh, the wildest thing about it is that the attorneys are wild. One of the things I've seen asked quite a lot is why is this going to trial? Everyone thinks that they're right. That's why it's going to trial. Gwyneth Paltrow is not going to admit that she's wrong. The plaintiff is not going to admit that he's wrong. And the plaintiff said some things after this case that were pointed out in opening and continued to come up, showing that he really enjoyed the attention from this case, held a press conference right after he sued her and filed it three years after this accident and has enjoyed the attention since then. I wonder how that's going to play to the jury. Let me know what you think about all of it in the comments down below. Thank you for being here for another episode of Quick Bets. And with that, it is time for us to go. I will see you over on my long form channel for streaming live coverage of this trial. Thank you, Lonards, for making it the number one place on YouTube to watch live trial coverage. I can't tell you what a joy it is to get to be in the chat with you as these trials are going on and see your thoughts and have conversations and answer your questions in real time. So I'll see you over there later today. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want more Law Nerd community, come join us at lawnerdsunite.com.